This video features my discussion with the owners of Viva Raw Pet Food regarding FDA policies and raw pet food manufacturing. Some have been asking why on earth I would continue to feed a pet food brand associated with a recall. The short answer is, it depends on how the recall came about and how it was handled by the owners of the company. Ultimately, I choose what is best for my pets. When it comes to pet food, you have to be able to trust that the owners of the company truly care about the health, safety, and well-being of not only the animals they feed, but the people who love them and our planet. I will only work with companies that take accountability for any issues that arise, make improvements, and continue to do what is in the best interest of our pets. However, even if I have worked with a company in the past, if at any point they no longer make decisions based on what is best for pets, I won't hesitate to end the relationship. The pet food industry is currently dominated by low quality, ultra processed feed. So I appreciate the companies willing to navigate the hurdles required to manufacture high quality, species appropriate diets. What you choose to feed your pets is your choice. My goal is only to provide you with information so that you can make the best possible decision for your own pet. Please enjoy the video. Hi, I'm Dr. Judy Morgan. Today my guests are Zach and Jen from Viva Raw, and they are silver sponsors of the International Naturally Healthy Pets Experience by All Provide, which will take place in Orlando, Florida in October. And so I'm really excited to have the two of you here today. Well, I'm gonna let you introduce Viva Raw, and then we're gonna talk about a lot of things that go into making pet food and some of the difficulties, hurdles, pains in the butt that you guys have to deal <laughs> with. So tell us a little bit about Viva Raw. Do you want yeah, to go into Sure. It? So um, Zach and I, we started Viva around three years ago, which kind of sounds crazy to say now. But <laughs> um, it all started, I mean, like, like a lot of people, we got our first dog together and we're just like absolutely obsessed with like figuring out what the best thing for her was and so one of the things we started doing was doing homemade like fresh diets for her and after some time we realized we we're just spending so much time DIYing meals and we we're like hey why don't we just go out buy something right and it really came from us like doing that search looking around and not finding anything that we truly love from like the sourcing the ingredients we just felt not as comfortable as when we were doing it at home so we had this crazy idea going like hey why don't we just um you know, how hard could it be? Why don't we just start our own pet food company? And that's kind of like, that's the beginning of it all. We started off in a commercial kitchen, eventually we moved into like a USDA facility. It's been such a journey through this point and we're really happy to kind of share more about that with you guys. It's a journey. It is a process. <laughs> it is. So, and your company has grown very, very rapidly. Um, so you're obviously doing some things right and people seem to really love the food. One of the things that's cool about Viva is that you offer not just, normally it's turkey, beef and chicken mm -hmm. that we see most companies those are the easiest to source the easiest to to make yeah. but you started out from the very beginning with some proteins that are a little bit more novel they're becoming more common sometimes you have special proteins yes. so what other ones are you doing routinely and what other special ones have you come out with in that three years yeah so we in addition to the three you mentioned chicken turkey beef we also have like duck and rabbit as a part of our core like staples. And then what you were mentioning with, we call them special. So our goal is maybe like four or five a year, five times a year, we try and bring in more novel proteins. Um, obviously with those, we're kind of limited by the availability. They're not as commercialized. So that's why we can't have them year round. But in the past we've done things like venison, bison, elk, like lamb, goat. It's always really fun for us to go out and source these proteins because we get just excited about feeding our own dog like something new. We really believe in kind of like the more diverse you can make your pet's diet, the better it is for them. Absolutely. You know, it makes them a little less picky too. So it's always like a really fun experience for us and our customers to just bring those in from time to time. Let's talk about some of the hurdles, particularly with a raw pet food company, because we all know that FDA is just not all about raw food. That's just another whole discussion for another day about why the difference is. But why do they have this zero tolerance policy for pathogens in raw food that they that they really don't have for, I mean, maybe they do, but it's not, it's not as well known or advertised with highly processed foods, which we know that there are many bacterially contaminated, mold contaminated, you know, pieces of metal, whatever, in highly processed foods. But why do they have this zero 
tolerance for pathogens in the raw food and what kind of weight does that put on your shoulders having to deal with that? Yeah, absolutely. I can go into that a little bit. Um, the first thing I'll say is probably our thinking about this from the beginning of our company to now has, has shifted a little bit. I'll be very, you know, upfront about that. You're correct in that it is a challenge. I think whether it's a challenge that people meet with a mentality of, you know, pushing back against the FDA versus realizing that this is a challenge and working to, to solve that hurdle is another thing. You know, over time, I think it's a big decision for a lot of companies to make. Um, and we've definitely taken the side of, okay, this is basically how the regulation is and this is the challenge and we're up for it. That's one thing that I'll, I'll mention at, at the, you know, being very upfront about how we think about it. The zero tolerance policy that you're mentioning is basically FDA saying that in a quote unquote, what they call ready to eat product um, and ready to eat um, in the way to say that it is ready to serve immediately. So of course, when you talk about raw poultry or raw beef products, the reason why they're not considered ready to eat is because consumers are meant to cook this product, right? Humans would not naturally just take a hunk of meat and just raw meat and bite into it. Some do. Some but... do, some do. <laughs> um, but it's against, uh, you know, what they typically would advise or the companies would advise. Um, when it comes to a ready to eat raw pet food product, what is happening is that this product is advertised to be fed as is. So as a result, it is held to the same standards as a ready to eat human food product, for example, which is like, I guess you could say any sort of like snacks or crackers or whatever, things like that. Those are not allowed to have any sort of presence of pathogens, right? Because those are going to be taken by any human and just eaten right away. The, obviously, part of the challenge is that, of course, you know, our, our pets are one aspect of the picture, which can't be denied. It is very, very important to make sure that the food is safe for our pets. But I think FDA is even more so than just pets concerned about the human aspect of it, sure. right? So when you're talking about pathogen exposure to say like elderly folks or immunocompromised folks, or maybe even infants, that's where you know most of the concern is. The FDA, the way that they sort of regulate and have to look at things is always on the worst case scenario. That's in the interest of protecting public health and in a very robust way. So for us, that means that we need to make sure that our food is safe if an infant were to encounter it or if an elderly person were to encounter sure. it. But you're right, it does cause a lot of challenges because naturally the raw ingredients that we're using are not necessarily going to be clean of pathogens. So it is our goal as a manufacturer to, to make sure that we are doing things in the process to make sure that it is pathogen free. Yeah, which is tricky. I, I watched a documentary on the poultry industry. It was a public health person, doctor who was talking about when you, he said basically, when you bring raw poultry into your house, consider it to be the biggest health hazard you'll ever encounter. And that's because the poultry industry is pretty dirty. Sure. They need to clean up their act. That's part of the problem. And USDA governs the poultry products that are in the grocery stores. They know they're contaminated, but like you said, they yep. expect that people are going to cook them and not eat them raw. There's definitely a difference in exactly. how things are regulated and how they're looked at from the human side to the pet side. We know that they have this zero tolerance policy and nobody wants to get their food tested and have it show up with a problem. What steps do you as raw food manufacturers take to make sure that whatever is going out of your facility is as clean as possible? Because I know that's gotta be a huge challenge. <laughs> yeah, that's like an hour long conversation or more. <laughs> okay, <laughs> the abbreviated version, bullet points. <laughs> Absolutely. I would say, let me start at the high level and then we can decide okay. what we wanna sort of like go into specifically. I think there is sort of threefold when it comes to making sure that our products are clean when going to the consumer. One is, I think we just talked about this, but the raw materials themselves are not necessarily always pathogen free. You can receive some tested product. For example, it is more likely that you would find beef products, for example, with some sort of COA that says they, it's been tested for E. coli 0157. The main three pathogens to look out for in pet food, by the way, are Salmonella, Listeria, and E. coli. When it comes to poultry, it's way less likely to have any sort of poultry producer that's going to guarantee that the product coming to you is going to be Salmonella free. I mean, it's basically unheard of. As a result, the number one thing that basically pet food companies or raw pet food companies have to look at is their hurdle or basically pathogen mitigation or intervention right. steps that are used throughout the process. 
This could be one or a multitude of different technologies. I think that like common ones that have been used out there, I'm just gonna list a, a, a few that I know of um, just in terms of what we've seen on the market, but like high pressure pasteurization is a common method. I think using antimicrobial sprays is a common one. Uh, you know, there have been sort of other ones with varying levels of success based on the research that have been out there. Irradiation is also one that people don't like very much, but is theoretically, you know, relatively effective. Just the hurdles or the mix of hurdles that are used for making sure that you're getting to, you know, zero pathogens is number one. The second is your testing procedure your finished product testing procedure, in order to accurately know that you are adequately you know, reducing your pathogen load to zero, you need to have some sort of verification of that being done. It's one thing to you know, pull one bag from you know, a very large lot that's being produced and say that one tested zero for salmonella and listeria and E. coli. It's another to have a more statistically representative way of testing. And that's something that we have sort of learned over time and made more and more robust as we've um, sort of changed as a company. The important thing there is just to consider just the prevalence of salmonella is not necessarily always very high in raw materials. I mean, it's always going to be there, but if you just tested chicken, you know, you probably get somewhere in the range of like five to 10% positive. Just say like you went to the store and tested like chicken breasts or something mm -hmm. like that. So what it means is that depending on where you are testing, one package could have it, another package could not. One package, even within that package, one area of it could have right. salmonella where the other one doesn't. So the goal is to show that you have a way of sampling that is robust enough that you are actually looking for it mm -hmm. or that let's say statistically, if it was there, then you would have found it. Right. So that's number two. And then the third that I think is very important and sort of understated is actually the way in which you manage your environment. And the reason why I say this is because raw materials are of course the primary way in which pathogens can be introduced into a finished product. But the other way to introduce it is from your environment if you're not practicing you know, good manufacturing practices, sanitation, cleanliness, things of that nature. There are a bunch of ways in which this can be done. Of course, it's really important the way in which you have your procedure for cleaning the facility every single day or after, after every single lot that's being produced. And then the other is just verification activities of that sanitation being done well. For example, environmental swabbing mm -hmm. um, that's being done around the facility to identify, hey, are there you know areas in this facility that um, could be danger zones for how that can actually get into the product. Right. So being able to design an environmental monitoring program around your facility and say, hey, we are very confident that our cleaning actions are reducing the pathogen load to zero from the environment means that it can only come from the raw materials. And if it can only come from the raw materials, then your intervention is successful at reducing it. I know that you have instituted testing mm -hmm. of products. Mm -hmm. When you run a batch of food, mm -hmm. first of all, what what is a batch? Is it a thousand pounds? Is it 10,000 pounds? Because I know it's different for every company. What's a batch? <laughs> yeah, so for us, a batch is like one day's of production. So we always do like one protein a day to minimize like any allergen right. cross-contamination. So just like one day's of production is what we count as a batch. And okay. the way you want to look at it scientifically is you want to have clean breaks between your batches. Sure. So each batch should be separated by like a thorough cleaning rinse mm -hmm. down which we do at the end of the day and okay so that batch that you made for the whole day then it all gets packaged up and all that stuff uh how many tests are run on that batch so i'll describe it in a sense of a, a number that will make sense for most people okay so i'm i'm, I'm probably gonna butcher this i'll be very very honest but uh if you think back to statistics and the reason why i'm gonna butcher it is because i don't remember that much about statistics <laughs> if you remember statistics and about how you know you needed a sample size that was representative um, there was often sort of you know you need to reach 30 n equals 30 or something like that. So for us, what we're doing is we're reaching a sample size of 30 samples for every 5,000 pounds that's being produced. Okay. So for example, we're taking 30 samples from 5,000 pounds that's being produced and then compositing that into one big sample that's mixed up of all of those 30 samples and then testing that for pathogens, Okay. right? If we produce 10,000 pounds instead of 5,000 pounds, then each of those 5,000 pound increments would have their own which in that case, we'd have 60 separate samples okay. and then two composites of tests Got out it. of those subsamples. Got it. Does every raw food company test their product before it goes out? Is that is that standard in the industry? 
Uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we, we haven't... I mean, obviously, <laughs> you don't know every company, yeah. but... Right, I mean, it's... Do you think that's standard? I would say, yeah, like, the expectation for most companies is that you do some sort of test and testing on your product. I think it definitely varies as to, like, you know, how many samples you're taking, like, what, what do you count as a lot, like, how frequently you're testing. So I would say probably all companies do test. It's just the difference in, like, frequency depending on, like, their whole production and that varies from facility to facility. Right. So basically, if you run a test, mm -hmm. I, and I'm going to bring up a, a sore subject because there was a, a recall of yep. your duck product back in January, which um, the owner had it or FDA mm -hmm. tested the product and it came up positive. But you tested, you hold back part of your batch mm -hmm. for testing, and you tested it, and it came up negative. So how often does that happen? Yeah. And is that handling after it leaves your facility that causes that problem? Or is it, like you said, just, you know, it could have been in one little part of that batch, and it didn't get caught in the sampling? Like, right. I mean, we can't know all the details, but what we can say is, obviously... Uh, you know, our focus has been increased around the robustness of our testing programs. Right. So as such, what we want to do is make sure that our sampling is more representative. So it has been increased since, you know, the negatives that we receive on that particular batch, you know, to, to what is currently being done. Um, we have increased the number of samples that are being taken from the lot to become more representative overall. So we don't know all the details exactly, but what we can say for certain is that it's going to be way less likely to have differing results between what someone who is testing more in your batch versus you know what our results are returning. It's always unfortunately going to be, the, the reality is that if you're not testing every single package, which no one is going to be, you could have different results, but the goal is that you're testing in a way that shows that statistically it's very unlikely to have different results right. because you're proving that, you know, the, whatever you're doing to control the pathogens are effective in returning, you know, negatives across 100 plus different samples. So. Right. This is why I never wanted to own a pet food company. Because <laughs> I, I am so all about raw feeding and I just don't want to play the game. So kudos to you for playing the game. Um, and, well, and, and having a good attitude about it. I mean, it really is all about making as clean a product as possible because sure. the last thing, you know, that we want as a pet owner is to feed our pets something contaminated and have them sure. get sick. Although they are much better at handling the contaminants or bacteria than we are. But that brings up a, another question. So salmonella, E. coli, you know, all these bacteria, they're ubiquitous in our environment and in our guts. Yep. I mean, there's there's salmonella that's not pathogenic. Yep. So when they're doing this testing, um, are they going to flag it for any salmonella or only for pathogenic salmonella? Yeah, so for salmonella, it's it, they don't distinguish between strains when it comes to like the policy. It's There's like hundreds of salmonella strains, yeah. but kind of the policy goes like, if, if it's any of them, then it's an issue. For wow. listeria, it's like specifically listeria monocytogenous. And then for E. coli, it's any sort of E. coli that produces like the Shiga toxins. So they do, so they do it just distinguish differs, that a little bit. Yeah, for E. coli and listeria, yes, it's a little bit more distinguished. More specific. Yeah. But as of now for salmonella, there's no, um, there's which, no distinguish. Which is really interesting because there's salmonella that's totally not pathogenic and that might could be what they're picking up and they just don't care. Well, whatever. <laughs> you know, it's sort of like, you know, saying that we have to eat something that, I mean, we, we, we want a healthy microbiome. We want healthy microbes going into our system. And they're basically saying we have to be feeding products with zero microbes, which, you know, I need to go talk to my dogs because they're outside eating dirt and eating poop and, you know, eating rabbit droppings. And I'm pretty sure that is not pathogen free <laughs> i don't know maybe who knows yeah. anyway so yes it, it's uh it, it's an interesting conundrum so let's talk more about your product so your product is one we, we get this question a lot if someone wanted to cook it could they mm -hmm. yes yeah so mainly the thing we do to make sure you can cook it is like the bone, the the size of the bone. The common wisdom is like you shouldn't feed cooked bones and that is for a good reason. It makes it more brittle, prone to splintering. So we grind our bone size down pretty fine. It's around like 
one to two millimeters maybe so almost like a sand like consistency mm -hmm. that was also a change we made from the start where you know after we were getting feedback around like the bone size we made sure to make that much smaller in all of our products now yeah your products are great they're minimized ingredients let's also touch on the fact that there are no synthetic vitamins and mineral packs added into these these are being made with whole foods but for a lot of people their pets don't do as well on raw sure. but they want to be able to feed that type of product so you know that's kind of an added bonus that it, it can be gently cooked if mm -hmm. need be. You guys are doing a great job. Uh, you have a good attitude about it. I, I, I'm guessing <laughs> that there's just a lot of sleepless nights and I, I'm surprised you have any hair left and it's not completely gray. So it's this a little is, bit gray. It's a little bit gray and that's, you know, in the past few months, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> So, you know, thanks for what you're doing and thank you for being silver sponsors for the event. I think it's going to be amazing. I think we're all going to have a great time in Orlando. Is there anything else you want to tell us about Viva? I mean, you guys have put your heart, I know, we met you at the beginning, so we know you have put your heart and soul into this. It's got to be a labor of passion. I don't know, or, or you're nuts. <laughs> Both, a little bit of both. I think you need some level of insanity to keep going. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But I will say the, the main thing is there's sort of like one aspect that we learned through the journey. I think that there comes a certain level of, especially in the beginning, I think it's, it's very um, easy and it, you can see why to be very cynical of the way in which um, FDA is regulating our product. I mean, it's just a given. It's really hard not to to feel that way about it. But I think it's important um, as pet food companies and uh, as manufacturers to take a step back and, and look at the bigger picture because I think ultimately for us to be producing our product and being able to basically support the the community and, and all the customers, I'm not saying our customers specifically, but customers who want like a, a fresh, healthy product, um, it's really important for us to, to take a step back and realize why, you know, regulatory is the way that it is mm -hmm. and make sure that we're in compliance with it. So I think that, you know, that's sort of been a big learning through through the past, uh, I would say, couple months and to even a year back is just realizing like this is bigger than just about us and sure. feeling like we're being, I guess, pursued in a particular way. So Yeah, but it also makes you understand why companies sure. go to things like yeah. radiation yeah. or... Uh, HPP, HPP exactly, or yeah. um, you know bacteriophages. Exactly, I mean, yeah. You know there are so many so many different ways that you can you can try to mitigate things. And sure. you know I think that sanitation and cleanliness and sure. you know bat single batches of you yeah. know, proteins. And I think that most pet food companies would would agree with that. You know raw pet food companies in particular. Sure. Um, just really interesting to go into some of the other types of manufacturing facilities and see how filthy they are and just be like, wow, like what a difference. And then when you go into a good raw food facility, the steps that are taken, the, the sanitation steps, the cleanliness, like how everything is handled, it really is totally different. Sure. I, I think that's just good for our, for our pets. For the pet parents, I applaud you for having that attitude <laughs> and, you know, continue. your product's a good product, so we don't want to see it leave. So, you know, keep going that Thank way. You. Absolutely. We're doing our best. <laughs> yes, you are. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.